You are listening to the weekly broadcast. One hour ninety. Hello and welcome to the weekly darts cast. I am Burden Dewitt, and I am joined by our amazing producer and my guest co-host for tonight, Hannah. Hannah, how are you? Doing good. Glad to be back from Blackpool. Hope you're doing well too. I I am, and thank you for filling in, Alex. Having some Wi-Fi problems. Um, hence also why this episode's coming a little late. Uh, he was trying to get the Wi-Fi fixed, didn't get fixed. So instead, uh, we got a big upgrade um, with you. And of course, as you mentioned, back from uh, Blackpool, you were there for the Women's Series on Sunday. We'll talk about that in a bit. But let's start out with uh, the uh, open event, uh, which, of course, went on all week leading to Nathan Aspinall winning his first major in four and a half years, his second overall, an 18-6 to six win in the final over the Ferret, who we'll also talk about in a little bit, but talking about Nathan Aspinall. Uh, what do you think that this title will do for his career? First of all, I can't believe it's been four years. That just blew my mind. Time has no meaning. <laughs> um, I was just like, oh, yeah, he won one so close to the last one. And then people are like, it's been four years. And I was like, so what? Um but I think what it's going to mean for his career is just obviously he told us about how bad his wrist was and the injury problems he was having and the concerns that were around the problems with his wrist and having to adjust and adapt to those issues um, with his throw and just hearing you know him describe all the problems that he was having with that wrist i was like i can't believe he can even like hold a pen let alone be throwing darts with any accuracy so i think having this come up as a big win you know after having a few uh decent runs and a few things over the last year or so and over a player who's quite a strong player as well like with johnny I think that's going to do a lot for his confidence and a lot to um, help him feel secure and the changes and adjustments he's making are really having an effect with how he is facing down the darts. So I think we're going to see continued good things from him. I mean, last year we saw him with the runner up with the Grand Slam. So it'd be interesting to see how he goes Grand Slam again. But I think I think it's only on the up and up unless something goes horribly awry. I'd try to still maybe baby that wrist a little bit. But uh, what a testament to overcoming that. This really has been overall. So sky was always the limit, but the sky is even more the limit nowadays and even more impressively so, if that can be said, for what he's had to push through. Yeah, he's, it's really remarkable just these last couple years uh, because – you know, he, he's always been a talent. I tweeted the year that he had dropped off the tour. God, that's how six, seven years ago. It's how, you know, it's a sign of just how good darts is that Nathan Aspinall doesn't have a tour card. I, I didn't necessarily think when I tweeted that in 2017 that two years later he'd uh, win a major. He'd make back-to-back world championship semifinals. But I knew he had a lot of talent. I think everyone knew he had a lot of talent. Uh, but he's never been as good as he is now. Uh, He's never been anywhere near as good as he is now. You know, you look back at the end of last year, making the final in Leicester in the World Grand Prix, making the final in Wolverhampton in the Grand Slam of Darts. Um, Yes, he was well beaten in both of those finals, although he did have a nice little mini comeback against Van Guren to uh, maybe scare MVG after uh, being four sets to nil down. But he's been so consistently good for a year now despite the injury despite everything and the only thing that hadn't happened was that major and you know you said it can't believe it's been four and a half years i can't believe it's been four and a half years that was in fact the last time i was in the uk i went to the uk open that weekend i had to fly back on sunday so i wasn't there during the final i was paying 20 US dollars for Wi-Fi to watch the UK Open uh, final uh, in the air on that Sunday. Uh, but 
he hasn't managed to cross the line, but it feels so recently, so recent. And now he has. And, you know, you go back to the Masters this year when Chris Doby won. And the thing I said about Doby's performance was that consistency. 94, 95, 96 every single match. It's not going to always win you the title. More often than not, it's not going to win you the title. But it is going to put you in the position to win almost every match. Yes, occasionally you'll run into someone who's throwing a 108 at you and you're going to get blitzed 10 legs to two. That's going to happen from time to time, but those matches don't happen that often. The MBG used to do that half the time or a third of the time, but he doesn't anymore. No one else is able to do it that often. So if you're doing 94, 95, 96 every single match, you're going to be in a position to win almost every single match. And... That won't win you many tournaments, but it will win you some, and it will win you some majors. Well, what was Nathan Aspinall this past week in Wolverhampton? Uh, sorry, in, um, in uh, Blackpool? He was better than that, at least for the first three matches. 98 and a half, 98, 99 and a third across his first three matches. Um, and then, yes, it went down a little bit, but it was still that 95, 96 over a longer format. 95, 96 over best out of 32 or best out of 34 is going to win you even more than it's going to win you over a best out of 11 or even a best out of 19 in the early stages or late stages of an event like the Masters. His consistency, his ability to, when he's at least to, when he's playing well, to be able to string those matches together is impressive. He didn't do it during the Premier League this year. That was the biggest critique I had. But outside the Premier League, he has been consistent. He has been able to almost every match play at, at, a, at a very good level. And he has become a smarter player. The fact that he has enough trust in his throw that he can stop mid-throw and re-grip when he realizes it's not correct. Either the grip is off or his concentration is down. The fact that he trusts himself to know that he is not ready to throw and it will not throw him off by stopping the throw and resetting is something that I've not seen from any other top player. Yes, occasionally a player might stop. Occasionally a player might do it. He will do it every single time where he realizes he is not in the perfect position to throw. And it means that that next dart, when he's reset, is correct because he's not going to throw until he's ready. It's not a thing of dartitis where he's afraid. It's a thing of, I know what I need to do and I'm not doing it right now. That's so impressive. But there's one more thing I want to point out because all tournament long, we were talking about his scoring because his scoring is up there with anyone in the world. It's easy to forget how good his finishing is, but it doesn't even need to be. In that semifinal against uh, Joe Cullen, uh, where his average was low, but his, that was well, at least the lowest of the tournament. But that was because of all those missed starts at double, so many times missing three at hand, and especially last in hand. In that match, overall, he was 17 out of 50. That's not terrible, but it's below the standard you'd expect from him. Only one out of three as opposed to the benchmark 40%. He was even worse last start in hand. Five out of 21 in that match, last start in hand at a double. That meant that many times Joe Cullen would come back, at least have a sniff, and that match could have easily been different if Cullen had just been more consistent in it because of how many times Aspinall missed that last start to give Cullen a chance. In the final, that didn't happen. First of all, 45% on the double is, well, pretty darn good, 18 out of 40. But last dart in hand, 9 out of 16, more than half of the times that he had a dart at double on the last dart he hit, which is why he had five ton plus checkouts. It's why Johnny Clayton, after being five all heading into the second uh, break, never really had a chance after that winning just one leg and barely having a sniff in the 13 that he lost. This was impressive. This was what Nathan Aspel needed because now he really is one of the best players in the world. He's up to number five in the world. He has every chance to reel in uh, the world number four, who, granted, has been playing pretty well this year, but he's close enough that he can do that. And he's close enough that he can pull in, at the end of the year, Peter Wright after the world championship money from two years ago drops off. Uh, this is given Nathan Aspinall a chance to join the top four, maybe even join the top three, not just somewhere down the line, but come January. 
And you're talking about his opponent there with Johnny Clayton, who fell short in the final. But how much can the ferret take away from his run going into the rest of the season? I mean, I think he can take away a lot because there's not really much he could have done in the final. Yes, he didn't play at his best. Um, Johnny Clayton at his best. Well, every time he plays MVG, we see it. Those are 105 average. But we, we see him do stuff like that other times as well. He was unplayable against Dimitri Vandenberg. He was unplayable in in fits and spurts against Luke Humphreys, especially over those last 12 legs after the last break. Luke Humphreys was doing everything he could to stick with Johnny Clayton and force it to 1715. But Johnny Clayton really was unplayable those last 12 legs. He was never unplayable against Nathan Aspinall. He had a chance early on to take a lead, missed a few tricks. Nathan Aspinall stayed in it. It was 5-5 entering the break. And then after that, He didn't have a chance. But Johnny Clayton overall across the week played really well. And one thing that has been missing from him is stringing together performances like this in ranking majors. He'd only won one match in the on this stage before in well, I was going to say in five previous appearances, but it's really only four appearances on that stage because 2020, of course, was not played um, at the Winter Gardens. It was played in Milton Keynes, but he'd only won one match on that stage before he won four this time. He's only gotten outside of the one time he's won the Grand Prix. He's only won two matches in the World Grand Prix. He's only he made the quarterfinals of the World Championship this past year, but that's the first time he's been there. He's not made that many deep runs in ranking majors. This was something that was missing, and now he's done it. It hasn't been his best year to date, but the last few months, he's reestablished himself. He did enough after a slow start to still get through to the playoffs in the uh, Premier League for the third year running. He won the World Cup alongside his compatriot, who he had a chance to move right on the uh, – right onto the uh, heels of for the Welsh number one um, if he had won the final. But he uh, won the World Cup with him. And, of course, he's, you know, won a, a, so far this year. He won a Euro Tour recently. He's won a Players' Championship. He's getting titles again. And he's getting himself back into the thick of the money end of events like he had been off the televised stage and like he has been in non-ranking events doing this on a in a ranking major and uh is something that he needed to do to really take that next step now he's done it it's a big rest of the year coming up because he's defending that uh world grand prix uh, money at the beginning of october he's defending a semi-finals in the players championship finals from two years ago in november he's defending a quarterfinal in the grand slam as well so you know there's some Deep ish runs, as well as that title that he'll have to defend. But thinking about it the other way, just by making the final of the world match play and uh, pocketing 100,000 pounds, considering that he went out second round two years ago, in essence, he's defended the World Grand Prix this past weekend. If he thinks of it like that, it takes the pressure off. He's no longer defending 110,000 pounds. In a couple months time, he's really just defending the 20,000. That's the difference between the world match play final and the second round that he that it replaced and that world Grand Prix title from two years ago. He's already done the hard part. Now it's just building. Now it's just adding to the ranking and maybe getting that second ranking major title. He has a lot to take away from this weekend um, because, well, it was something that he needed to do to really make sure that he's still at the top of the game. He didn't win the title, but that's just one event. He's going to put himself in that position. If he plays like that, especially if he played like he did that last session against uh, Luke Humphreys, um, he's going to put himself in position over the course of the rest of the year to win that second ranking major, maybe even a third, maybe even a world championship. Yeah, I agree. It's, um, Interesting to watch as the end of the year comes about, because we know that there's certain people, including one we're going to discuss later, who tend to have a little bit of a floppy start to the year. But then as events pick up toward the worlds tend to get stronger and stronger. And again, when we talk about Nathan overcoming his, you know, wrist issues that he overcame, uh, you know, Johnny has made it clear that he's got an illness in the family. And as much as people would like to think that you can parcel that away, 
um, and think about something else, you know, things of this nature weigh really heavily on you as a person. And to try to shut it out when you know that somebody in your family, especially for his dad, who's a big supporter and who wants to see him do well, and he's having this run. So it's not just, oh, I'm having a run and isn't it good and I can enjoy it, but it's gives it more weight to it that he's unwell, that he's going to be able to see this happen. And it builds a bit of expectation that is difficult to overcome internally as well. So I think the fact that, first of all, Nathan became, like you were saying, with the finishing, almost unplayable um, after they, you know, after the first 5-5. Five, five. So it's hard to focus on that. But also the fact that he does have a good game and he can bring that good game and like you said it can bring it for a full tournament but just the the moment wasn't there for whatever reason i think i do think besides the beast mode issue that nathan has which it's fun to be talking more and more about different players reaching their beast mode instead of it just being mvg always but i think as well as that just the level of expectation and then also the level of expectation when you go from 5-5 five, five to start being behind and I'm not saying he gave up but that feeling of this has gotten away from me and oh my gosh and that potential feeling of extra disappointment because of the extra pieces outside of the game that it's going to mean to you and mean to those around you is just something that's tripped up people with you know, stronger games than Johnny Clayton's at the moment and is, is fantastic. So I don't think there's anything that he should take away other than he can, and he can do this under trying circumstances. And if the circumstances remain trying, if he focuses, he still can overcome these moments. But I do think it's wise that he's decided to sit out the uh, trip down under and kind of refocus on, you know, the back half of the year was going to be plenty busy and there's concerns there. So I think he's made some wise choices. And I, if, as long as he brings that game to the rest of the season, he'll, he'll end it just fine. He really will. So hoping for nothing but good things for him and his family and, you know, good wishes for them as a group, as his father's unwell, just upsetting to hear across the board and we wish them all the best that's echoing those sentiments now we'll move on to our interview for the week uh we've been talking about the uh, uh open world match i will talk about the women's event afterwards but first let's hear from the champion and of course uh you were there on sunday you spoke with Bo graves here is uh your interview with her Fresh off of her match play win, we're with Bo. Bo, first of all, how how was that experience overall from start to finish? Yeah, uh, it was hard, I think. It was um, borderline trying to be enjoyable, but also trying to like live up to the expectation people wanted to be at. But I was just very lucky that some of the ladies didn't play as well as they can do, and um, I just took it over the line. And when it comes to that expectation, obviously you also have your own expectation of what you can achieve. You have the expectations of things like bookies and stuff. And then how how do you still find that people, you know, when you start winning all these tournaments, the expectation of what you'll do, you know, you're 19. How does that start to weigh that it never gets smaller, it only gets bigger? No matter what you achieve, for some reason it keeps getting bigger. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard one. It's, um, it's like a fine line of wanting to do well for yourself, wanting to prove to people that obviously you are good and you can sort of make it but it's um it's so hard you know you the lady series you've got you work towards this one tournament a year and if it doesn't if it doesn't go well then you're starting from scratch again and obviously it's that's just hard to sort of get your head around but um yeah i deal with it quite well i'm used to it i've had it since i was 12 so um and obviously some people have really strong feelings about WDF versus PDC things and even some people may say winning the women's championship as you win more and more of these how does it feel to kind of shut down the naysayers as they move the goalposts to keep chasing them down as well yeah I think there's space for both 
the, as much as the PDC probably don't want to admit it, the WF is like grassroots for darts. Took over from the, the BDO. That's where pe- most people will go before they go to the PDC. So th- there needs to be space for it. There needs to be time for it. It needs to be well looked after because at the end of the day, that's where they get all their players from. If you ask any of them the top eight in the PDC where they've come from, it would be the, all playing in a BDO comp, WF, whatever it is. So it's, yeah, they just need a little bit of um, time for it and a little bit of funding. And obviously when you were playing, you found a bit of a beast mode against Robin. Mm. where all of a sudden the average was going up, up, and up, and up. Yeah. Does that just feel like it clicks differently for you when you get into a moment where the hundreds are starting to come easier? Yeah, um, I struggled all day with my just getting a good range. My darts were either high or they were low. You know, and I think, like, when I go towards the Alipal or the Grandstand, that isn't going to be good enough. So I need to sort of try to get used to that and get a good range going. But it's, I think in certain games, I sort of know when to click on mm-hmm. and when not to in certain times. And obviously, thankfully, I had that against Robin. I was able to just push through towards the finish line. Yeah. And obviously, uh, your game has evolved alongside the ladies' game. Because obviously you've grown, the ladies' game has grown with more and more opportunities more recently in the past few years. Do you have any hopes beyond, you always, you know, you're always reticent to kind of set goals for yourself, but do you have any hopes that maybe there will be more women's tournaments on big stages, maybe longer formats, maybe more things? I mean... Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I I hope that the format will increase. Do you know, it's hard going up there playing best seven and expected to sort of perform to the levels you have to in the women's series. Different because you've got more games playing. Um, yeah, it's hard to sort of go up there and um, do your best. Yeah. But you know, it's all a learning curve, isn't it? It sure is. And then you've got your Grand Slam debut coming up, and that's not far off of the Lakeside, which is not far off of Alexander Palace. <laughs> so, uh, busy few months in there. Mm. Any ideas on how to prepare for such things, or can you use one as a preparation to lead into the next, into the next? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I'll just probably uh, get to it as it comes and uh, see what happens. But I think the women's series would be a big help in that, sort of playing all the time and um, having a lot of games and build my confidence. But I hope that I can go to the Grand Slam and the Pities, obviously the other pally, and um, mm-hmm. just sort of play playing my darts but it's just hard on the stage and um, obviously the women's series is next weekend in Milton Keynes again do you get any time between now and then to just kind of take in the big trophy the funds and have just a moment to just breathe before you have to be back on the practice board before yeah submit? I'll probably take it and put it next to my fridge or somewhere <laughs> I, uh, I'll put it somewhere, I don't know, but um, yeah, I'm just thankful that I was, I've been able to um, play in this and uh, I hope it just gets bigger mm-hmm. and bigger and I'm just happy I'm the one taking mm-hmm. the trophy home. Yep. And as you've stressed over the years, it's important that it be fun for you, even if it is a game that you're winning trophies and winning money at, it's it's a game and if you're not having fun with it how can you find your best level with it mm. are you still able with all these new tournaments and challenges and everything are you still managing to have it be fun for you yeah I think it's a difficult one I think I do find it a little bit more of a challenge when I'm playing the men but um, that comes with experience comes with time and it's hard to find it fun when you know you've got to go up there and sort of play under average all the time. I think in the ladies you've got a little bit more of a cushion to sort of um, develop with and uh, take time. But um, yeah, it just comes with experience and figuring it out. Yeah, you know, that's just life, isn't it? Yep. And here's to many more experiences. Thank you so much, Bo. Cheers, guys. Thanks to Bo for taking that time to speak with us. Now, as I said, we're going to switch gears and talk about the Women's World Match playing out the second staging of the event at the Winter Gardens in Blackpool. Bo Greaves on debut, her first appearance there, but a unsurprising first title. 16th title now from 21 events in the PDC uh, in the Women's Series plus the Women's World Match Play as she continues to dominate the game. Um, 6-1 win over the double former world champ, Makuru Suzuki. Now that she's, quote, completed ladies' darts, uh, what's next for her? That's the interesting thing when it comes down to Bo. Um, the people, uh, it's interesting because as she meets each of these things that we kind of expect her to, people continue to speculate. And I think people forget that part of this expectation and speculation 
and you know oh she's so young and oh look at what an amazing game she has is a little bit of what caused her to have this kind of internal dartsitis situation that she had a few years back as well because she is still 19 and if you think that you want to be committed to playing a sport for the rest of your life at 19 is a big decision and it's a lot to think about so a lot of people really do kind of immediately go into what is next for you what is next for you in fact um I was listening to the press conference before I got some time to speak with her for that interview. And the final questions of the press conference were, do you want to get an MBE? Surely you'd be on board for an MBE if Fallon got one. Surely you have time to achieve it. And so people just not only look to the next tournament, but also look above and beyond. And that's not to say that that's not something that's in her future, but in speculating for these things it puts a reasonably huge amount of pressure on a 19 year old still so i said it once before i'll say it again what's next for Bo is whatever she wants it to be she's going to be at the grand slam for the first time she's going back to alexander palace she didn't have a horrendous game against willie o'connor and in terms of luck of the draw she probably would have beaten almost anybody else who went up in the first round um, so it'll be interesting to see how she approaches that again. And she didn't bring her full top of her game to the Winter Gardens either. And it's, she's an amazing player across the board. And the fact that she's an amazing player and that she is playing in these events and that she is bringing out more and more of the best is just so beneficial to women's game overall, because people will have to find new levels of their game to play her. Just like when Lisa got her tour card and people were finding new levels of their game to be able to play her. But I think she's probably going to stay on the women's series um, for a decently long time. For her, like she said, she wants to stay playing darts while it's fun. And for her, winning is fun. And I was there that weekend in Milton Keynes where she just couldn't get it together and wasn't winning and was having an absolutely miserable time. And she still threw her all at it to try to come through. But she was joking with Noah and she said, gosh, just put me out of my misery. And she fought tooth and nail against Noah, but the game just didn't come across and Noah won. So there are times when the game dips a little bit or people bring an extra level to it that's making it a little bit more difficult. So when people say, are you going to go to Q school? I don't think that's on her to-do list anytime soon. I think that's something that she'll entertain down the line if she finds more consistency. And it's funny to say more consistency, given she is quite consistent and wins basically everything. But the way she's defining consistency for her is different from what people around her is and is different compared to the field of people around her. I think she's looking for more of a consistency uh, in terms of what would perform well if she did have a tour card. I don't think she wants to go have a tour card and compete week in and week out to lose her tour card after two years and just have spent all that time putting, you know, all the grind in with very few results. So I think we will we'll probably continue to see her completing women's darts over and over again until she finds herself comfortable with the consistency that she has and committed to this. Um, so I do look forward to what she'll bring. I think that she'll have um, all sorts of achievements if that's what she wants for herself. But I think for Bo's sake right now, I'll say what's next for her is she'll go and she will win a couple of women's series and she'll do her best at the Grand Slam. And she might manage to get a luck of the draw and come through with somebody that's not Willie O'Connor at the Worlds. And it'll be exciting to see. And then she'll do it all again next year. Uh, and that's my forecast for Bo. You said a very important thing uh, near the beginning there, which is that it's what, you know, what does she want to do? And I think that's something that uh, a lot of us um, forget, especially when we're talking about younger players. You know, you go back on the men's side, Harry Ward a few years ago, uh, won a tour card, won a title, um, but all the added um, pressure and attention that came with uh, – 
being lifted towards the top of Dart so early in his career made him realize that this isn't what he wanted out of life. Uh, he enjoyed, it wasn't that he wasn't enjoying darts. He w- wasn't enjoying going around, the, at least around the, the UK and Europe, week in, week out competing and having to put in all that time and effort. Um, and again, losing most of the time. Uh, because in any given match, only half the players can win. So, that, you know, you subtract the top few players in the world. You subtract the MVGs, the Michael Smiths, the Peter Wrights, the Gary Andersons. Once you take away all of their matches, most of the matches are gonna, left are losses because that's the way it goes. And yes, Harry Ward was probably winning close to half, maybe even more than half. But there's a lot of losing going on. And he realized that's not what he wants to be doing. He wants to be working in something else. And now this year, after a couple of years away, he went and did Q school and not to try to win a tour car, but so that he could play challenge tour and compete and see how he does. And it's something that's easy to forget, especially when a player is young, is we don't know what they and they probably don't know, I should say, of course, we don't know, but they don't always know what they want out of darts. So they don't know what they want out of life. And that means what's next for Bo. Even she might not know uh, that said, you know, she can learn from someone like Harry Ward and from other players who, when they were young, went and played on the tour. And then some who we never saw again. Some who we've seen sporadically, some like Dean Reynolds, we're just now starting to see him play some open tournaments again after deciding the tour wasn't for him, turning turning down a tour card. Uh, so I don't, I, I just don't know what's next for her. And I don't even know, and as you pointed, that she might not yet know what's next for her. I do think that if she thinks that she wants to keep progressing in the game, at some point she should go and at least enter Q school, even if it's not to win a tour card, even if it's just so that she can get that experience and be able to play the challenge tour, that's something that's worth considering. Now, all you have to do is play one day of Q school to be eligible for, at least under the way the rules have been, only have to play one day, those rules could change. But as the rules have been, you only have to play one day to be eligible um, to play the challenge tour that year. And maybe that's something for her to consider in the near future if that's the direction she thinks she wants to go. If she thinks she's ready to go and actually try to play on the tour, then yes, you go to Q school with the goal of winning a tour card. Um, I think it's something that might come in the future, but whether that's next year, whether that's somewhere down the line, only she possibly can know. And it's very possible that she doesn't yet, and that's okay. Um, Within women's darts itself, I think she's going to continue to play the uh, women's series. There's no reason not to. It's still good money on the line. And especially when you're winning three quarters of the events, that means you're coming out of most weekends with some decent pocket change. And she's qualifying. Uh, uh, She's now qualified for both the Grand Slam and the World Championships. But now start to put yourself in that position to do so again next year. Make sure you get to the Women's World Match Play. Make sure you get to the World Championship in 2024. Uh, sorry, 2025 World Championship. It's weird thinking that when we're only in 2023, but of course the World Championships are named for next year. Uh, so there's stuff that she can start building towards and aiming towards over the next six to nine months, even before she has to decide on what 2024 is going to bring to her. Um, so I guess the answer is, I don't know. And It's all right if she doesn't know. There's a lot of future for her in the game if she wants it. Uh, But again, she's 19. And we we need to remember this not just about her. We need to remember it again for the top male youth players as well. Um, And it's something that's easy to lose track of, especially when someone is as dominant right now as Bo Greaves is and as Luke Littler is becoming over um, in other events. And how would you rate the world match play and women's world match play overall? What were your highlights and lowlights? I guess since we're talking about the women's world match play, I'll start with that. I I do think it was a little um, uneven, but over a short format, you know, that's what you expect sometimes. Um, You know, the final was a bit of a letdown there. Uh, Makura Suzuki in her semifinal against Lisa Ashton just couldn't get going. Lisa Ashton and Fallon Sherrick couldn't get going in their quarterfinal um, with uh, Lisa Ashton missing a ton of doubles early. And, and that made it a little bit of a disappointment because some of those matches we were really looking forward to just never 
they might have been tight like that Lisa Ashton Fallon Sherrick match, but they never materialized into the titanic struggles that they could have been. But there were some highlights. You know, that Bo Greaves Robin Byrne match was fantastic. Um, uh, Bo Greaves with a uh, uh, three figure out shot to break to go up four three when Robin Byrne was sat on a double to try to move within a leg herself. That is a match that easily could have gone the other way. And that was a match that really was um, exciting. The Robin Bird ran a Sullivan match was also a tight one going down to the last leg. Robin Baron taking out double nine, sorry, double 19 uh, uh, to uh, win it. Um, just some fa- just a f- fantastic match. Makura Suzuki, fantastic against Aline DeGraff, the reigning runner up um, over on the uh, men's tournament. I thought this. I mentioned it earlier in the show. The uh, semifinal between uh, Lou Humphreys and Johnny Clayton was just a fantastic match, and Johnny Clayton's performance after that last uh, break was uh, just incredible. That's why he was able to get over the line against someone who looked like it was his week because Luke Humphreys really looked ready. Um, yes, Damon had a nearly came back, winning four legs on the spin, and having was waiting to win a fifth one and very well could have just piled on, but Luke Humphreys got over the line, but Luke Humphreys was just by far the better player for most of that match. And it was just a um, absurdity that had got back into it. Uh, Humphreys. Yes. He was let off the hook by Dirk Van Dyven Boda, something that has been happening a bit recently, but at the same time, Luke Humphreys just hit everything when he needed to um, some just, Phenomenal performances, but again, he just got outplayed down the line against Johnny Clayton. And there were a few other matches that, you know, really tight ones. Um, and the performances to beat the top players, Chris Doby knocking out Michael Smith with a really good performance. Joe Cullen um, against Gurren Price as well. Uh, but let's not forget, and how can we forget, the very first round with Michael Van Gurren becoming only the second reigning champion to go out first match, losing to Brendan Dolan. Uh, Dolan looked by far the better player early in the match, and somehow MVG hung in there. MVG was hitting at the right times, Dolan letting him off the hook, and it looked like, okay, MVG's he's gotten it back to five all, despite being the second best player. Okay, now he's going to come back from the break and run away with it. Nope. Brendan Dolan just kept doing what he was doing all match, but not letting MVG off the hook now. And he ran away and won that match uh, for one of the all time upsets on the uh, on the uh, Winter Garden stage. Overall, I thought it was a very good tournament. I won't put it as great. There weren't there weren't really that many superstar performances, but there was consistency and across the entire week. Um, so overall, I'll give it I'll give it a. B plus uh, as a tournament. Um, so I think that's what it deserves. Yeah, for me, uh, I guess I'll start with the men's because I watched the women's a little bit closer, having been in the arena. Um, I have to call out for one of my highlights. Damon Hedda and his walk-ons, they are doing exactly what he wants them to do. He's not taking himself too seriously. He's trying to get the crowd to have some fun. It's kind of like going to Germany, and when you win your first match, talking about how you love the German crowd. It's pandering, but it's great pandering. And and it's even better by the fact that the Ashes hadn't been lost until Damon was out of the field, so people couldn't have big feelings about it one way or the other. And what a gimmick it was. It was just so fun. And then to have him have such deep run, I mean, you love to see it. Um, And one of the things that I really loved about the tournament was I did love that we always talk about how there is such strength and how the men's game is getting harder and harder so that the people at the top of the game aren't necessarily always the ones who are going to be safe. And so to actually have one of the big tournaments where the big top names were knocked out before even the quarterfinals made it feel fresh and exciting. That's not to say we haven't seen Luke do big things or Nathan do big things or, you know, any of the people that made it to the quarters. It's not to say that we haven't seen them do big things. It just felt special to not have your girl in price, your MVG, the people that you still kind of take for granted and the bookies kind of take for granted will probably be there by the time the dust is settled. And it made it feel 
to me at least, more exciting and more full of promise. Now, that's not to say that other matches, when they do win, don't become full of promise from other things. It was just, it felt like a refreshing break from the usual suspects at the top, as it were. And it was great to see everybody highlighted that they all could bring this groups of averages and that, you know, people that had been written off overall made it through, you know, fairly early on and continued to push onwards. And so we could see Chris Doby, you know, not gone in the first match. And it was just a lot of fun. Um, So it may not have been the highest overall averages on the men's side, but I thought it was significantly more fun than it's been. I don't think I've had this much fun with the men's portion of the match play since Menser took on Gary Anderson. Not going to lie. That's still hard to beat, but it's been a while. And then the women's world match play. I mean, you called out the best matches. Um, I knew going into it that Fallon and Lisa was going to be not as good as Rianne versus Robin had the chance to be. But Rianne and Robin, of course, making their debuts. And if you get nervous upon debut, it's very easy to not bring your best average there and not bring, a, you know, your best game. So the fact that the two of them were in the 80s and ran through the average, the highest average of the tournament up until Mikuru threw a higher one against Eileen. And even that didn't win. But the fact that they always talk about, now that we're here, we want to do a good impression. Even if I don't win, I want people to see what the women's game can do. I want people to see it. And we saw that last year, that there was a bit of a stage shock with things. And being there and people were having a difficulty finding their best averages because there's really nothing like it to compare it to even the women's finals with the women's championships at lakeside is just a whole different beast it's still playing on you know for the tv and thing but you don't have a big full media day with press where you have to be interviewed by sky and have your interview played on the big screen before you go up there's just a whole bunch to it that gives it a whole different feel where there is nothing like it so the fact that Rianne and Robin were able to go up on their debut against each other and bring pretty much their best games, not their greatest games, but bring those high averages to it, is a real testament to the skills that the pair of them have. And then Makuru bringing her 92 average when she played against Eileen. And just these moments overall of genius that maybe it wasn't Bo's highest average and maybe it was tighter than it could have been and maybe the final didn't go as it was. Uh, I'm still impressed that Makuru can in under 72 hours be on a board, let alone know where she is, because I certainly can't in her shoes. So what she achieves through her jet lag and things is impressive. And what Bo gets through with fighting her own mental issues of expectation and weight on her shoulders And for me, it's just such a narrative about we want the women's game to be visible and we want it to not be people panicking and throwing 40s, 50s, 60s. We want them to show the best they can do. But that creates another round of expectation and that expectation creates an even harder barrier to find those things. So Rian versus Robin was definitely the game of the women's for me. I mean, I enjoyed watching the whole thing because they did do better than than they played last year. And I think that we have a group of women here that not only raise the standards of the game through their ability to reach these high averages overall, but I have a feeling that next year we probably won't have a field where it's five people different. I would expect we would see a few of these ladies again. And once they get another chance at it, I mean, especially if Rianne and Robin make another chance at it, they know they can bring their best game to it. And if they can encourage the others around them to bring their best game to it, I think we're just going to, in continued stagings of this, see higher and higher averages like we can see on the women's series. And we do see the 90s and the high 80s from some of these players. And I think we will see more of it as time goes on. So it was just an absolute highlight that two people on debut who were quite nervous about the whole thing, even though they were trying to pretend they weren't, they, you could see they were reasonably nervous, were able to put that aside and produce up there with their best games and fight it out tooth and nail in front of everybody. And I am just so chuffed for them. 
and uh, gutted that it wasn't enough for Rianne, but chuffed for Robin, who's also, I'm told, a super fan of the Weekly Darts cast, so congrats again, Robin. And uh, I just can't wait to see the next one. I wish the formats were longer, but they're not, and it is what it is for the time being, but if this raises the standard and if they continue to go on, there's every possibility that maybe there'll be more in the future. So it was, for me, a lot of highlights. I didn't see too many lowlights for me, other than the fact that I was too exhausted and I couldn't make it to the final and had to pass out in my hotel room. But it was it was a lot of fun this year, and I look forward to seeing where it takes us next year. Yes, indeed. Hopefully uh, it will be back on the calendar next year and uh, maybe... You know, you mentioned the eight players. Who knows? Maybe sometime in the near future it can expand because you, know, you look at the quality of the players who missed out this year. Uh, now, we'll end with a couple of listener questions. Uh, we'll do these ones a little rapid fire. Um, first one comes from Boris the Chinchilla. If the world championship started tomorrow, who would you back to win it? If it started tomorrow, I would go Luke Humphreys. Not because I didn't watch what just happened, but like you said, Luke Humphreys had the consistency with his game. He played a lot of really strong players and still had that consistency. And again, if we're phrasing that it starts tomorrow, you know, Johnny's personal situation hasn't relented. Uh, Nathan just got off the board and I would think would want to give his wrist a little bit of a break between things. So I think that you're consistently strong best chance candidate if it was to literally start tomorrow would be Luke Humphreys. I think that's a really strong case. I mean, I've said about Dirk Van Dyven Boda that if you get to the line, then it means you're good enough and ready to cross it. And okay, it was the semifinals, but Luke Humphreys got to the line. He didn't cross it, but that didn't mean he wasn't ready. That didn't mean that he wasn't able to. It just happened that someone outplayed him down the stretch. Um, and I've said it as well about Michael Smith, you know, when he got to the world final against Peter Wright and looked like he was going to cross the line and become world champ. And then Peter Wright threw the best 10, 11 legs of his career uh, to turn that match around. Uh, eventually, a year later, he did cross the line first at the uh, Grand Slam and then more importantly at the world championship. Uh, but I'm going to go differently. I, I think that this year, the best player has been uh, Gurren Price. Things can change uh, very quickly in darts, but I think Gurren Price is just a more consistent player than he's ever been, and he's a stronger player than he's ever been, and he knows what he needs to do better than he's ever known before, and he's already been pretty darn good at th all three of those things in the past. I think he's just in that position to dominate, and sure, he can run into someone on their day and lose, but it's going to take a performance to beat him, at least the way he's playing right now. So if I had to pick it today, if it was starting tomorrow at least, which is what this question asks, I would go Gurren Price. And our next two listener questions come from Nicholas Wolf. And the first one is, do you think Peter Wright is about to crash out of the top eight? I think it's very, very likely that he is. And it's not because that he's, you know, he's not moving in the correct direction again. I do think for the first time over the last couple of months, we're seeing Peter Wright not where he was two years ago or a year and a half ago, but at least start moving in that direction. He struggled last year. He struggled even more at the beginning of this year, but he is starting to look like a top 10 player again, but he's defending so much. He's defending the players championship final money from two years ago. He's defending the world championship money from two years ago. And that is going to make a big difference as things currently stand. He's closer to dropping out of the top 16 overall than he is to remaining in the top eight or it's basically about the same 70,000 pounds in either direction, slightly closer, um, actually, uh, to staying in the top eight. But that's not where a player of his caliber would want to be. Uh, you know, he's down to 14th in the provisional post Ali Pali rankings. Um, are at least eight of those players ahead of him playing better than him right now? Yeah, I think they are. 
Uh, and that means, as things currently stand, I think he's set to fall out of the top eight. Whether he stays out forever or whether he has a renaissance again, we'll see. We've thought he was finished a few times, and he went and won a world title both of those times. Maybe he'll do that again. But as things currently stand, I'm going to say yes. And I actually am going to say no, not because the quality around him isn't quite high, and not because he doesn't have so much to lose. Because I do know that he's got quite a bit that's reaching that two-year mark. But I think, as slightly alluded to earlier, he is one of those players that seems to have a bit of a slow start to the year, and then as we get to the back end of the season, finds his footing a bit more. Um, so I think that because he doesn't, you just have to outlast, you know, the next person in line, uh, so to speak. And I know that that's quite difficult because that's Danny Noppert, who's, you know, at the ninth spot who would be trying to break in and replace it. And he's doing quite well. But I think that there's every possibility with what we have left that he will, you know, turn on that A game again and get further in tournaments and maintain that spot. Um, if he continues to only pursue it at the back end of the year, I think he's going to have a much harder time because I don't think we'll necessarily see him become world champion again this year because every year the field gets harder and harder. But I think he'll manage to stay in the top eight, but I think he's going to run into a situation where instead of getting better, at the end of the year, he's going to find that he needs to put in a little bit more oomph into the beginning of the year. But we shall see. And lastly, another question from Nicholas Wolf: Is James Wade ever going to win the Worlds? Uh, Nicholas adds, set play isn't his thing, right? Uh, and I have spent so many, many, many times waffling about how people are great players, and it's really hard for me to tie down an answer. So for once, I'm going to get off the fence and say, no, James Wade is never going to win the Worlds. It's called waiting for a reason. It, he's got bigger averages than he puts in. And I don't know what it is about his game that he usually throws like a half an point in the average more than his opponent wherever they're at and kind of meets them that way but I haven't seen too much of just beast mode James Wade come to the front and as each year passes and each year brings more and more difficulties in reaching that title and more and more people like your Josh Rock and your Jean Van Vane and people who have amazing amazing skills kind of off the bat and seemingly almost like They've emerged from nowhere and other people raising their game to meet it. I think the time of the James Wade world final is, is over. If I have to be honest, I'm, I'm going to agree. You know, it's another player like Peter Wright that we've written off before, not necessarily us two, not necessarily the show, but just people in darts. And then out of nowhere, he wins a couple majors. Uh, but there's something different about Wade now that has me a little bit more worried uh, because, you know, if you look back a few years ago, he lifted his game to his scoring face to levels we hadn't seen before. And his finishing was just as clinical. And it looked like maybe finally he was emerging as a player, reemerging, I should say, as a player who could win a world title. Um, and he did win a couple majors, and he's even come back since then. But he never, never took that next step. He never progressed from there. And now there are so many players who can do what he can do, but better. Players like Damon Hedda, who can play his level of consistency, can play his nerveless game and take those checkouts. Johnny Clayton, I'll say as well, but are so much more complete. And James Wade is just a, is now the s second or third or fourth best example of the James Wade style. So I'm going to say no, I I'm prepared to be wrong. And I'm not saying he won't win another major at some point, but I am a little worried about his stature in the game now. And I am beginning to think that maybe we're seeing James Wade go the way that many players before him have gone and start falling down the rankings. I'm not 
convinced that he's um, improving, even though a lot of people were high on him entering the world match play. I wasn't. Um, I'm prepared to be wrong. I've been wrong about Wade before, uh, but I'm going to say I'm going to agree that he's not going to win Worlds. Anything else for you this week? I uh, just want to say congratulations to James Wade on winning the Worlds this year after the two of us wholeheartedly agreed that he wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, that seems to be our luck when it comes down to picking the finalists of tournaments. So congrats to him. And again, thank you to the PDC and Dave Allen for helping me get set up to do interviews, especially the special extra time with Bo. And uh, congratulations again to all eight of the ladies who qualified for the second staging. And it was a great time to be up there. Yes, uh, echoing uh, congratulations to Wade in advance uh, for his dominant performance in the World Championship final over, uh, well, we disagreed on Peter Wright, so I'm sure there's someone else that we agreed on that wasn't going to do anything. That's the player he'll beat in the World Final. Um, Thanks to uh, Dave Allen, as you said, uh, for everything that he's done uh, to make sure that we can bring you all these great interviews. Um, We'll be back next week. I think next week is it's August. We might take a week off at some point because there's less going on. There are the World Series events going on down under, um, but which we'll get to. And there's other stuff, Women's Series coming up as well. Uh, But we'll see what those are and we'll see what we can do and we'll see who we can bring you. Uh, Just hang tight until we do.